Hi, David. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Vancouver? Very good. It's friend sunny, so you can't complain. Yes, it's not often you see the sun out there. Yeah, tell me about it. But when it is, I think it's one of the nicest cities in North America. Well, it's a beautiful city, and even though it rains a lot, I still love spending time outside here. So, David, Sandstorm has 41 cash-flowing assets, which are contributing to just over 80,000 gold-equivalent ounces, or GEOs, and this will be growing to over 150,000 by 2029, and this will spin off huge amounts of cash flow. And I just want to touch on some of the assets will, which will be driving this growth. And the first one I want to touch on is Greenstone, which is an open pit mine in Northern Ontario. And it just recently achieved first gold in May of this year. Why don't you take us through this asset and how important it is and what will it mean to Sandstorm when it's up and running? Yeah, listen, this is uh, this is going to be a great mine. It's been one of the ones that we've been eagerly anticipating from the Nomad acquisition that we made back in 2022. So it ends up becoming pretty nice, good cornerstone royalty for us uh, as it gets into production. So yeah, like you said, just finished, uh, just started first gold pour. I know that they have, uh, they've stockpiled a lot of ore there. It's going to be Canada's fourth largest gold mine in terms of ounces produced on an annual basis. Uh, it's been in that development pipeline for really quite some time. So it's great to really kind of finally see it hit that. It's designed exclusively, and the reserves are designed exclusively as uh, open pit target. Uh, it's uh, not too far um, uh, outside of uh, Thunder Bay in Northern Ontario. Uh, in a well-known mining district. So uh, Equinox Gold, which is really Ross Beatty's uh, current uh, vehicle in the gold space, uh, it's really going to be much uh, by head and shoulders a large project within that portfolio. So really a key producing asset in that group. Um, it's pretty standard, uh, you know, Ontario Gold type of project. Uh, they're... Uh, the mining that they've been the stockpiling that they've done so far has reconciled well. So that's a big key important item. Now it's a matter of really making sure that they ramp up. Once they do ramp up, they're getting to that over 400,000 ounces per year production for the first five years. So that's great for us because uh, we start seeing between seven and 10,000 ounces per year uh, accredited to us through that uh, project. So uh, we're happy to see it up and going and we certainly wish uh, Equinox, the best of luck to getting the project up and going. The budget went well on this thing. The timeline went pretty well on this project as well, too. So uh, we're really pleased. It's uh, it's looking to be kind of one of those outliers in that gold space, which has seen some big uh, delays and time overruns uh, and cost overruns. Uh, but this one it has uh, has really hit the marks on that side. And David, what's the mine life on Greenstone and is there potential for upside through expansion or exploration? Yeah, there's a good 14 years on that project in the OPA pin, uh, potentially even higher depending on where the gold price is there. But the uh, geologic model for it really points well to a potential underground mine. Uh, if you take a look at really the long section of the project, the ore body plunges down uh, over to the west, uh, and it's really uh, that's when you really start seeing a lot of size to it. Equinox is going through a lot of those economic studies right now, and the feasibility of really an underground project. Uh, if that continues on, we get full exposure to it, as always on these projects. So uh, we just have to wait and see and see how uh, the economics start unfolding for that. But there certainly is that potential for expanded open pit and a higher gold price scenario, which we're seeing right now today. But also uh, some potential uh, amazing underground uh, production that could come up and continue to feed that mill uh, for years to come beyond uh, the existing mine life. David, the second asset I want to touch on is Ivanhoe's plant reef mine in South Africa. Production of phase one will begin sometime next year, but the real growth will come from phase two and phase three. Why don't you take us through this? And you were recently a site, so you can give us firsthand information. Yeah, it was really an extraordinary site visit uh, down in South Africa. Um, the team is great there. 
uh, very experienced. Many of those people that are building that mine on behalf of Ivanhoe have built everything that's really kind of in the DRC so far. So really a good team, well accomplished at building these mega projects. Um, so yeah, uh, they this project eventually is going to have seven shafts associated with it. Uh, they are currently building and boring uh, the largest shaft in all of South Africa, Shaft 2, uh, which is going to have a, uh, a, a more than 4 million, or actually more closer to 8 million ton per year hoisting capacity on it. So really an extraordinary shaft, 100 meter tall head frame on it, 10 meter diameter, uh, really going to be a, a very impressive part. I was able to see a lot of that both at the bottom of the shaft and at the very top of it. Uh, so they're working on really primarily underground development work and building that mill right now. Uh, so they uh, they got a great team there. Um, so they've done a focus and they're going to continue to focus on development work for now. One of the amazing things that they've done is converted what was a previous vent shaft into a haulage shaft. So that boring has basically completed right now. They're just on the last steps of it, of shaft three. That's going to have a huge hoisting capacity, 3 million tons per year as well too. So uh, because they've decided to really kind of change the sequencing of some of their development, uh, they may be able to kind of push towards this phase two production sooner rather than later. One of the items that we're eagerly anticipating towards the end of this year is an updated feasibility study, which will talk about really how they can increase that phase one. Phase two, it will be a big increase. Currently, what that feasibility study is, is to start with phase one, which is relatively modest at 800,000 tons per day. But once phase two comes online, you all of a sudden see almost five times as much overall annual production. Now, right now, that's slated till uh, start 28, 2028, 2029 at this point. But with this conversion of shaft three, there may be that ability to have some sort of intermediate step there. When you talk about phase three, which has been first really talked about in a more tangible way just over the last quarter, uh, it's an even bigger jump up. It's basically duplicating what phase two comes, uh, provides uh, in terms of tonnage by two more additional times. So phase three, uh, which they're uh, they're really creating a PEA on that or have created a PEA on that right now, takes it up to 10 million tons per annum on this project. So for us, it really is, a, I think, an extraordinary project. We love being attached to this asset. Uh, it really is going to be one of, it will be, once it gets that phase three, effectively the largest PGM and nickel producer in the world. We, of course, hold a gold stream off of this project. Um, which is 30% of the gold that will get produced in this project, uh, but it could operate for what really decades to come, even at this this very high production rate, if they are able to achieve achieve phase three production. Well, that sounds quite impressive, and and I want to put this into perspective. You said the head frame was 100 meters tall. Yeah, head frame 100 meters tall. The, the shaft is going down. Uh, almost a thousand meters, uh, so that's where they're gonna they're gonna be hauling from almost a thousand meters back up to surface. Uh, it's really a, a, an enormous project. Um, the mill plan with the mill is just to really create one that's gonna work well and just keep replicating that over and over again. So it's a very sound plan, very capable team by what has been the most uh, the company that has the best history of building mega projects across the world. And they're our partner on this on this asset. So we're gonna go from one large mine to another one and that's Antamina. It's the world's third largest copper mine and it was recently granted a license to increase the size of the tailings facility and this will increase the mine life to 2036. Why don't you just provide an overview of this mine and what it's gonna to mean to say it's storm. Yeah, uh, Antamina really is one of those remarkable mines in Peru. Really uh, still, I think, the lowest cost, 
base metal producing mine in Peru at this point. Uh, they've been operating uh, since the very, very early 2000s. Um, it's a SCAR deposit, produces copper and zinc as really primary products, uh, but also has some motley associated with it, has some silver associated with it, or really a large, lot of silver produced from that project. Um, this has been operated as open pit for quite some time. One of the most efficient, it's been making a tremendous amount of money, a great team, primarily BHP and Glencore Tech and Mitsubishi. They're the owners uh, of this asset. Uh, it's uh, it's high up, sits high up at around uh, the mine. It sits between sort of 4,200 meters, 4,400 meters, really a high altitude mine. Uh, they've gotten the permit now to extend their tailings, their existing tailings deposit further again, which is great news. Um, but they continue to look at this whole idea of long-term production. And uh, even though they've just finished that process, they start to work at really what that next uh, tailings expansion might be, either again at the existing one or potential new sites uh, that they can utilize as well too. Uh, so this is something I think that most people had anticipated, certainly when we get the deal to acquire this royalty, we anticipated this was uh, had a high chance of happening as well too, uh, just because of the high quality of that team that's associated and the high quality of the overall mine. Um, one of the, the more important things that we're eagerly looking at is this idea of how a potential underground mine might look there. This is something that every, every year goes forward. It's not something that's going to happen in the next uh, couple of years, but really as we start seeing that project mature, they're going to want to continue to target this amazing material that they find at depth. Um, and they're going to uh, continue looking at that uh, and seeing how they can bring that material up and send it to that existing mill. But still, I still do believe Antomina is one of these projects that still is generational uh, uh, in terms of timing, how, how long it's going to last for. Uh, it really, it, even though the, the current reserves take it to 2036, that's really just based on that tailings availability. As they continue to increase that availability, those reserves, I think, will go up, continually go up. And then as they start spending more time thinking about that underground potential that's there, we'll, we'll continue to see that expand. So uh, it's one of those projects, uh, you, you always want to be attached to these types of assets uh, because they're always going to surprise you to the upside in the future. And I'm curious if you, uh, if, did you do a site visit to Antamina? And if so, oh yeah, yeah, I've been to Antamina. Uh, it's really extraordinary. Not, not everybody could do those site visits because of the high altitude. It, it's really a pleasure to see projects like that. You know, I've known about this project my entire career. So getting a chance to go up and see one of these legendary mines, uh, I always want to take advantage of it if it's available to me. And I was going to ask if you were impacted by the altitude. No, I manage, I, I generally tend, you know, when you go up to a high altitude like that, you never know what you're going to get. I've been lucky every time I've been, uh, I've been able to handle it. And I think one of the things are truly is that I do get so excited about these projects. I don't know if, uh, 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 if when you, when you do get a chance to see something up at a high altitude, uh, maybe if I wasn't so excited, maybe I wouldn't be able to handle it as well, but uh, but I, th I feel I always get spurred on by that. So let's move on and we have to discuss Hamadan. This is the largest asset in your portfolio. It represents approximately 11% of NAV. You were recently in Turkey. You've been traveling all over the world this year, but uh, give us the latest on Hamadan and when can we expect a uh, construction decision? Yeah, listen, as always, it's a real pleasure to go see that project. It, it, it really... It's extraordinary to see it. It's extraordinary to look at the drill core. They've started actually, uh, uh, the operator there has started making progress on some of the early works. So for the first time, I started seeing preparation works for really getting the project built. Of course, it, it's, it's really permitted. It has its EIA. It has its forestry permit uh, for what it's doing. 
what's been happening over the last year and has been a lot of optimizations uh, to the uh, feasibility. Of course, with the new operator in the project, the SSR, they're looking to put their own stamp and really implement a team. Uh, the operating entity is called Artman. That's the Turkish company that actually owns it. And uh, Horizon uh, and gets their uh, Horizon Copper, which is where we have our gold stream coming off of. Uh, it's attached. It's one of the owners of those assets, as is Lydia made in Chile, and as is SSR, who is the operator of the project. Uh, so they've been optimizing it. They've been really kind of creating a timeline for it, uh, starting some of these early works projects. Um, it still needs to undergo project financing. Uh, and we still have to really kind of see what the timeline is going to be. Of course, the operator has had some problems in Turkey with their tripler mine. Uh, we're still understanding what the fallout of that is and how that might affect it. Currently, I mean, we still have the permits on the project. It is ready to really go into that construction phase, but we do have to go finalize some of the project financing on it. In the meantime, though, we continue to have the experts work on it, the design work happen on it. Uh, we continue on their early works. So there are items moving forward on this. We still, uh, you know, we push back the original production from 2027 to 2028. Um, we'll have to really kind of uh, see how that, uh, as it moves into that full construction phase and get through, first get through the project financing phase, uh, we need to be able to understand what that timeline is. But in the meantime, that asset really continues to impress as we see gold prices and copper prices rise. Uh, the economics just get more and more amazing on this project. Uh, you know, once you're talking about 13 gram type of material, 13 gram gold equivalent coming to service, being able to mine that at where we have copper prices today where we have gold prices today, that just gets amazing. So the mine's still there, the deposit's still there. We have a community that's really hopeful, that really wants to see the project up and going. We are really hopeful to see this project up and going, uh, but those economics preserve themselves, uh, even if there is a delay getting there. So one of the elements that I really enjoy most about royalties and the whole model of royalties is optionality. And one of the assets in your portfolio that really fits this category is Mara. It's a brownfield asset. It's owned by Glencore. And when you acquired this royalty, it was in 2015 and gold was at 1200 bucks. And now, of course, gold's at 2400 bucks. But take us through this asset and where it is in the stage of development. Yeah, listen, again, this was uh, another part of that amazing Yamana deal that we did in 2015, which included Chapada, Saramoro. This was a little bit of an add-on deal. I know uh, Yamada at the time was looking for a little bit more of an up upfront payment, $12.5 million is what it was. Uh, and what that bought us was an option at our choice to purchase a 20% a, a uh, gold stream uh, at a 30% of the spot price going forward of that Mara project at the time. All right, that was Agrarica at the time. Yeah, at the time, Yamana owned 100% of the project. They were the only ones in there, but subsequent, in fact, relatively quickly after we did that deal, Glencore started getting involved. Newmont was involved. Since that time, Glencore's accumulated all of these pieces. Now they own 100% of it. They've merged it with Alambrera. So Agrarica, which was at its own a greenfield project, which would have needed a mill, it would have needed really kind of its own facilities at a port to be able to really export the concentrate. Uh, it would have had its own mine. Now it's all combined with an existing permitted used infrastructure of Alabrera, which is now this Mara project under Glencore. And of course, Glencore, one of the largest mining companies in the world, they're highly motivated to get this project up and running because they don't have ore at Alabrera anymore. If they don't, start using, utilizing that Alambrera infrastructure, which is a mill, fully sized mill, tailings facility, and a uh, pipeline, a concentrate pipeline uh, that goes down to the port. 
uh, which is a really valuable asset, as we know here in, in South American operations. Uh, if they don't utilize those things soon, they're going to be looking to close it down by the Argentinian government, which is going to incur an enormous cost to them. Glencore doesn't want to see that happen. They want to be able to continue to use this. Agrarica, the Mara project now, as it sits, has got a 28-year mine life with potential beyond that. Glencore is going through and doing a feasibility study. There's the potential that they might give the go-ahead for this project as early as 2026. That's when we actually have that ability to take that option. At that time, $225 million upfront payment we'd have to make, but we would make that in stages as Glencore does spending on the construction of this project. So it would probably happen over two years. Uh, for us, this would be one of those remarkable projects because it's basically priced at $1,400 gold. We've had gold prices that are more than $1,000, over $1,000 above that subsequent to that. In the next two years, when we actually have to make that option, almost well, certainly it's going to be above that. If you were to price that in today's dollars, if you were to sell that stream today, you could probably sell it for $400 or more because it's such a high quality project. And of course you have Glencore as the operator of this asset. So um, if we were not to do anything else in the portfolio, if we were to buy anything in the meantime, between now, call it 2026 or 2027 or 2028, when the project starts producing, uh, we would still continue to have, that would be one of, certainly be the most accretive deal that could be found out in the industry today and would be a great deal for, for us and, and, and provide us with a tremendous amount of growth. So that's something that we're, we're really interested in. And we're really happy that we took that risk early on to secure an option on really what's going to end up becoming one of the best and most important new copper projects to be built over the next five years. And I just want to clarify one thing. You said if you could sell it today, you said $400, but do you mean $400 million? Yeah, sorry, four hundred million dollars. Yeah, where we will end up, our option is for two hundred twenty-five million dollars. Right, right. So huge upside there, David. I want to discuss your balance sheet now and capital allocation. And with the increase in the gold price, Sandstorm is throwing off a lot of cash flow. It's and it's provided Sandstorm with a great deal of financial flexibility. And your objective, since you took on all this debt in two thousand and twenty-two, was to pay down that debt. Maybe you can just take us through where you stand now and how much how much debt you paid off. It I believe you started with six hundred and fifty million. Was that correct? We ended up we took we drew a total of six hundred and thirty eight million dollars altogether on our line of credit uh, over time. We are down now to about at the end of the quarter at three hundred and eighty. So we've done I think we've tried to be as aggressive as we possibly can on that. Now, with the higher commodity prices, that's done, uh, I think, a great job of providing that capital for us to be able to allocate to that. Um, so we've uh, we really spent 2023 really as aggressively as possible, paying that down at the beginning of 2024 as well, really taking advantage of those higher commodity prices to pay that down. That continues to be our number one capital allocation item. However, we have gone back into that uh, potential share buyback mode as well too. Now it's not aggressive. We haven't been really strong uh, on it, but we did want to start picking away and look at allocating capital to that just because we see ourselves, especially at where we think the new kind of baseline commodity price, uh, price lines are at. Uh, we see that as a, a nice accretive way to do it as well, to pay back our shareholders is that share buyback program as well too. Again, not as aggressive, nearly as aggressive as we have done at periods of the past and probably not as aggressive as we might do in the future because of course still our number one capital allocation is pay down that debt, make sure that we have availability of credit uh, and and make sure uh, we're, we're moving forward uh, um, and, and making sure liquidity is available for us if there's additional deals for us to do in the future beyond the Mara project, of course. 
So let's talk about the buyback. And the reason why you're doing it is because you, you are trading at or near your NAV and you think you represent very good value. And you're trading, when it comes to valuation, you're trading below uh, a lot of your comps. So maybe you can just take us through why Sandstorm is trading at a, such a big discount to its comps and also what you and your team are going to do to tighten up that valuation gap. Yeah, I think there's two main port points. One port has been that debt. You know, that was the biggest comment that we had all through 2023 from institutional shareholders and many, many retail shareholders as well, too, is that, you know, we're at entry and we're in a high interest uh, rate environment. Uh, you really need to, we don't want to see levered companies. Uh, so that's why we've taken such a strong approach to it. But another important part in terms of valuation is really just this idea of percentage of assets that uh, of your overall net asset value that are in development rather than production. So we've been hovering a little bit over 50%, whereas most of our peer group is in 80% to 90% range of their NAV is producing assets. So a big change for us is just Greenstone alone. So as Greenstone gets into production, that gives us a big hit. Oh, in fact, gets us probably up over about 65% of our over 65 to 70% of our overall net asset value will be a production at that point. When Plant Reef gets into production, that puts us up a little bit higher as well too. So that's some of the things that we can look forward to, I think, over 2024 is seeing a re-rate due to the fact that we're just naturally seeing because we're talking about that's why it's so important to talk about our future is in construction is that as these construction projects convert into production projects all of a sudden you see that natural re-rate happen because a higher level of our NAV is in production so that's I think even though a lot of things aren't changing in 2024, I, I would argue that some of the biggest changes is something that threshold that we've never been able to get over for the, really the last five years is this idea of really having all those big growth projects finally get into that production phase. For us, that's, I think, a huge key part of looking at our value relative to our other peer group. And just to summarize all that, construction leads to production, which leads to cash flow. Correct. Yeah. I mean, everybody, the story is always about cash flow. Every once in a while, of course, the market really values optionality. But we have that as part of our production as well, too. Not just from the cash flowing assets, but really that package of call it 180, 190 other different uh, royalties in the background. Well, David, that was a great overview and a great update on Sandstorm Gold. And maybe you can just summarize for us what shareholders can expect in terms of news flow in the coming months. Yeah, listen, I think it's really important to see. Uh, we'll be giving the market updates on really how Greenstone produces uh, and gets to uh, its, its level. As we start seeing updates on other projects, uh, this year we can expect updates on Plant Reef. Uh, in terms of technical updates and timelines. Same thing on the Mara project, a little bit more definition on the timeline for that project as well too. Uh, and then Han Manen as a really kind of project projects uh, through. These are all real key assets in our portfolio, but as well too, we'll be keeping up and keeping the market up to date as to all those different assets that are seeing more and more capital be put into them and the type of uh, 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 type of uh, improvements that it's going to make to uh, the overall portfolio that stands from all time the assets. Once again, David, thank you. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on the show.